of the creation of the Lord. We'd like to welcome the brothers and the sisters, the youth and the children to today's conference, which is called Safeguarding the Youth. Our conference today, the program is as follows. You'll have, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, in a couple minutes time, a lecture by myself, that is Talib Alexander, and that should run for approximately 45 minutes with questions and answers. After that, at 6.30, you should have, inshallah ta'ala, Sheikh Ahmed al Nahash who will be giving a lecture and question and answers in which he talks about parents' attitude towards issues the youth face daily regarding love and the concept of love in Islam. And knowing the Sheikh, he will be able to take general questions as well pertaining to the topic of youth and as well as questions from the youth themselves. I'm sure our young brothers and sisters they have many questions they'd like to ask about difficulties they find themselves in, particularly in institutions of learning like college or university. So this opportunity for you to ask somebody who is qualified to answer these questions, rather than asking your friends who may give you the right answer or may give you the incorrect answer. With that being said, without further ado, I would like to start my presentation today. And my presentation today is based upon two verses from the Qur'an. The verse, first verse of the Qur'an is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, quu anfusikum wa ahlikum nara, wa quudaha hijara, na, wa quudaha nasun wa hijara. Allah says in the Qur'an, O oh, you who believe, Save yourselves and your family from a hellfire, whose fuel waqudaha nasa wal hijara. People, that is humans and stones. The other verse, and it's a very important verse, is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Anfal, وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَ لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and fear the fitna which affects not in particular that is those of you who do wrong but also those afflicts those people who do good and this is a very important verse in the Quran on the one hand we have the verse where Allah says to parents especially and to the men of the, of the family, O oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your families from a hellfire whose fuel is men and stones. So Allah warns us to pay particular attention to our families, the women, the children, and the youth. And so the men folk today should pay close attention to what I'm going to talk about today. Also, Allah warns us, all of us, and fear the fitna, the trial, the tribulation. This trial and tribulation doesn't affect only those people who are sinful, those people who ignore the injunctions, the injunctions of Allah, what Allah says to do or not to do. But this trial, this tribulation affects those good people. However, those good people are silent, not enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. Concerning this verse, brothers and sisters, that great commentator of the Quran, Ibn Kathir, he says, Allah warns his believing servant of a fitna, fitna meaning a trial, a tribulation, or a test, that encompasses the wicked and those around them. Therefore, 
Such fitna will not be restricted to the sinners and the evildoers. Rather, it will reach the others if the sins are not stopped and prevented. And so we see, brothers and sisters, it's not enough for us just to see sinful behavior or attitudes and say it, does have, it has got nothing to do with me. It doesn't affect me. But rather, it is upon the believer, according to their capability and their capacity, to warn others and to stop this fitna, this sin. What I'd like to talk about, brothers and sisters, concerning the word fitna, trial and tribulation, are four main trials and tribulations to face this ummah. Our beloved Prophet wasallam, has warned us he has told us in verse after verse after verse that there will be Yawm al Qiyamah, the day of judgment, where every single one of us will be held accountable for the things that we said, that we did, and we believed in this world. And the person who is rich today in this world may be poor on the day of judgment, poor in terms of his deeds. And the person who may be rich, he thinks that he has many good deeds, may be bankrupt on the day of judgment, muflis. And the Prophet told his Sahaba who the muflis, the bankrupt person is. And that bankrupt person is the person on the day of judgment having good deeds the size of mountains. But because he sinned and he transgressed against other people, these good deeds were taken away from him until he had no good deeds left and he was entered into the hellfire. So our Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, وسلم, has told us that before the establishment of the Day of Judgment, there are going to be major signs and minor signs. Major signs to show us that the Day of Judgment is soon. And from these major signs is the Masih al-Dajjal, the false Dajjal the false prophet. The return of Isa, the return of Jesus, alayhi salatu was salam. Ya'juj wa ma'juj. The three eclipses, the smoke, and there are a number of other major signs. The prophet has also told us that not only will there be major signs that are things that are huge as events, great as events, but things that are minor, that may be seen as normal, everyday things. And from these, brothers and sisters, for our lecture today, we like to look at four things. The first of these things is the proliferation, the spread of alcoholic beverages. The second is the proliferation of zina, fornication. The next is the proliferation of music. And last of all, which is very important, is the spread of murder and senseless bloodletting. That is, people being killed without any purpose and any reason. And so let us look, brothers and sisters, at the first of these things. The first of these is the proliferation of alcohol, the spreading of alcohol. Not only the spreading of alcohol in the non-Muslim lands, but the spreading of alcohol in the Muslim lands. And alcohol, brothers and sisters, we have been told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is prohibited, it is haram. Allah tells us in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu, innama al-khamru wal-maysar wal-ansab wa-azlam, rijisun min amal al-shaytan, fajtalibuhu la'allukum tuflihun. Allah says in this verse, the 90th verse, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth chapter of the Qur'an, O oh, you who have believed, indeed, intoxicants, khamar, intoxicants, and gambling, and the sacrificing on stone altars to other than Allah, and using arrows to tell the future, are but defilements from the works of shaitan, so avoid it, that you may become successful. And the Prophet Sallallahu has told us, in a hadith that is authentic and collected by Al-Imam Abi Dawood about the curse of the person who deals in alcohol where he told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the authority of Umar where the Prophet said 
Allah al khamra the curse of Allah be upon intoxicants. Sharibuha, the person who drinks it. Wasaqiha, wabaiha, wamubtaiha, wa'asiruha, wamata'asiruha, wahamiluha, wamahmula ilayha. The Prophet ﷺ told us, the curse of Allah be upon the one who drinks it, that is alcohol, the one who pours it, the one who sells it, the one who buys it, the one who squeezes the grapes or the fruit that is used to make it, the one who squeezed it, the one who carries it, and the one to whom it is carried. So we see throughout the chain of alcohol, from its drinker all the way back to the person who produces it, they are cursed. Cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so now, after establishing the prohibition of alcohol and that in the Quran and the Sunnah because many Muslims unfortunately don't know or understand that alcohol is prohibited we like to look at this spreading of alcohol the Prophet وسلم, told us in a hadith that is, has been narrated by Anas ibn Malik may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him where he said وسلم, Rasulullah sallallahu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Messenger of Allah, salutations of Allah be upon him, said, Min ashrat al saa al yurfa al ilm, wa yuthbit al jahl, wa yushrib al khamar, wa yadhur al zina. The Prophet said, From the signs of the last hour, from the signs before the establishment of the Day of Judgment, that knowledge will be taken away, and ignorance will be prevailed. And liquor, alcohol will be drunk, and zina, adultery and fornication will become rampant. And brothers and sisters, this is the prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who told us over 1,400 years what would come to pass, what would transpire. And many people question the hikmah, the wisdom of prohibition of alcohol. But if we look, brothers and sisters, at the statistics, it tells us why alcohol has been prohibited. And I'd like you to be a bit patient with me as I would like to say some statistics. And I have many statistics here. Many statistics. But we'll only use three or four statistics. One statistic. That alcohol is a main factor in more than 60 medical conditions. <coughs> that people consuming or over consuming alcohol is one factor, a main factor in over 60 medical conditions, and they are mouth, throat, stomach, liver, and breast cancers. High blood pressure, and psoriasis of the liver and depression. That people suffering from these, and these are just some of over 60 medical conditions that the, that the doctors have traced back to the consumption of alcohol. Another statistic, brothers and sisters, is that the misuse of alcohol costs over 21 billion pounds per year in healthcare, crime, and lost productivity costs. 21 billion. Can you imagine if the national debt is 100 billion? To get us out of the red, we need 100 billion. So a fifth of this. A fifth of this huge sum is spent in lost days in work and healthcare costs. Another important and alarming statistic is that it is estimated that 2.6 million children in the UK are living with parents who drink hazardously and 705,000 are living with dependent drinkers. So 2.6 million children living in living houses in which people, their parents, their carers are people who are dependent on alcohol. And nearly 1 million children live in houses where their parents or their carers are alcoholics. Now let's look at some more statistics, but some incidents. Alcohol the, the using of alcohol is a factor in 20, 20 
to 30% of all accidents and 22% of accidents in A&E and if you yourself were to go to the A&E on a Friday evening or a Saturday evening, what do you see? A vast majority, the vast majority of people who are there with, a different, with different ailments and different accidents, it can be related to alcohol. Maybe they drank alcohol and they slipped, they fell over and hurt themselves. Or maybe because of drinking alcohol, they were in an altercation between themselves. And I remember, Alhamdulillah, many years ago, I went, I took one of my children to A&E for a minor accident, and it was like a war zone. It was like Beirut or somewhere. People with gunshot wounds, blood everywhere, and each person was dressed up finely, meaning that that night they went out to the pub or to the club. And either in the club or the pub, or to the club or the pub or home, something happened. The last statistic I'd like to share with you, brothers and sisters, is that in 2011, there were over 208 drink drive deaths on the road in Great Britain. And 43% of pedestrians, that people walking on the street, killed in road accidents, had been drinking. And I've only told you four or five statistics, and I have maybe another 10 more statistics, to show you the great loss that we are suffering in our society from the consumption of alcohol, from people drinking alcohol. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over 1,400 years ago warned us against the spread of alcohol and the danger that it may lead to. One of the other problems we face, brothers and sisters, with the proliferation of alcohol, the alcohol spreading, and alcoholic beverages spreading, is that we find, unfortunately, in our community, some of the ulama al fitan scholars of fitna, trial and tribulation. Not the ulama of sunnah, no. But some ulama who have not the qualifications to actually give fatwa, who make it permissible for people to drink alcohol. Even minor quantities of intoxicants. And our Prophet Sallallahu told us about this, where we find in a hadith of Abu Malik al-Ash'ari, where he said that he heard the Prophet Sallallahu said that there will be bin ummati aqwaman yistahilun al-hirra wal harir wal khamr wal ma'azim and that in this hadith that we learn that the Prophet Sallallahu told us that there will be a people yistahilun that they make permissible they say it's okay it is Islamically all right to consume alcohol when clearly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messengers as we have heard have made it impermissible to consume alcohol. And so we say this is a side point for us to be aware and aware when we have people telling us that it's okay to take an intoxicant. And when we talk about intoxicants, we don't just mean alcohol but also Drugs, because we have had people in Islamic history, what they have said, that alcohol, no it's not alcohol, it's sharab or ruhi, it is a beverage for the soul. And so what they do brothers and sisters, they rather than changing the reality, they change the name. Hoping that by changing the name of the thing, you have changed the reality of the thing, but it stays the same. And so we have today, Peddlers of evil, peddlers of death, where they have what they call legal highs. Legal highs, where they sell different types of intoxicants, drugs. And these drugs have the same effect as any intoxicant. While it is not called cocaine, has the same effect as cocaine. While it is not called hashish, has the same effect as hashish. And all of these brothers and sisters are intoxicants, that are not only haram, but as we've said many times in the khutbah, that are spiritually dead, a killing. That it leads to somebody dying spiritually because the Prophet told us, in the body, 
there is a morsel of flesh. If it is good and righteous, then the rest of the body is good and righteous. If it is corrupted and bad, then the rest of the body is corrupted and bad. Indeed, it is the heart. The second of these things, these evil things to spread from the signs of the Day of Judgment, brothers and sisters. And as you know, how does this tie in with love? It is very simple because these things are the key to somebody's heart. And people use these things, such as alcohol, to establish a form of bravery. And where they feel they can't normally do or say things, they use alcohol. And how does it fit in? It is clear. And so, we find from the Prophet وسلم, a warning where he said, وسلم, Min ashrat as from the signs of the last day, that knowledge will be risen and, in, and, and, and ignorance will be widespread. And the spreading of, and, and the drinking of alcohol also will be widespread and the appearance of zina, adultery and fornication. And so we see our Prophet وسلم, warning us of a time like our time today where fornication and adultery will become prevalent. And if you were to come to the United Kingdom in the 60s, it was a totally different situation to today where people would be engaged and they were caught, and conjugal relations would only take place in marriage. Where now today, brothers and sisters, and again I have some more statistics, and these statistics are for those people who feel that it is not enough just to hear Qala Allah wa Qala Rasul. And for the believer, Allah said, His Messenger said, should be enough. But some people unfortunately have fallen into the trap of the rationalists, where they need to hear things like statistics. And these statistics, brothers and sisters, are shocking. And they are as followed. In the United Kingdom, over 50 babies a year are abandoned. Meaning, over 50 babies, newborn babies, are left in bins, in gutters, in parks, in streets, in roads, in car parks, in the doorways of hospital, over 50 babies. That's, if you think about it, almost as many people as mustard today. Can you imagine that? Are abandoned. And it's such a growing phenomenon, brothers and sisters, that there's now calls to have something called baby boxes. What are baby boxes? As most of the young people know, that many places outside police stations, certain massages and certain churches, if you have a knife, you can safely deposit your knife in this box. It's a safe place because knife crime has increased amongst young people. And as you know, if you have a knife, it carries an automatic five year sentence. What they say is an amnesty. You take your knife, put it in the box, you're safe. If you don't put your knife in the box and you're caught with it, five years automatically, irrespective of what, whatever reason you have. So what they are saying now, because of the high incident of babies being abandoned, and we all know why these babies are being abandoned. Babies are not being abandoned because mummy and daddy doesn't want to look after them. Usually babies are abandoned because of shame. Somebody is having a baby out of wedlock and there's shame and disgrace attached to it. And so they're saying, having these boxes in different places. So if you want to abandon your baby, rather than just leave him in a dustbin, and the baby could be carried away by the bin people, here's a safe place to place your baby in this box. Another and shocking statistic, brothers and sisters, is that in 2010, over 47% of children were born out of wedlock. 47% of children were born out of wedlock, meaning that many of them do not know who their fathers were. Another shocking statistic, brothers and sisters, 
in that in 2009, over 482, 696 new, new STDs were contracted. And if you don't know what an STD is, go to Google and type in STD. And if you look at the statistic of specific STDs, brothers and sisters, it's shocking. But suffice to say one statistic, that in 2009, there were more than 6,630 new cases of HIV AIDS. New cases, not old cases, new cases. And this, brothers and sisters, should be enough for the person to realize the evil of Zina. We in the United Kingdom are amongst the highest rates of divorcees in the world, people who are divorced. And according to government statistics, and all these statistics I've mentioned today, I have them here documented. Here in the United Kingdom, one in eight marriage that ends in divorce is due to adultery. So we have eight people divorcing. At least one of these is because of adultery. And so we can see, brothers and sisters, how grave this issue, the spread of fornication and zina is in the society. The last statistic I would like to leave you with, and it's a very shocking statistic, is that in 2011, and all these statistics I've given you, brothers and sisters, they're British statistics. In 2011, there were over 200,000 abortions taking place in this country. 200,000 abortions. If you want to understand how many, what's the population of Bedford? How many people in Bedford, brothers? 200,000 people, yes? So if you can imagine one day, like we see in science fiction movies, you wake up and all of Bedford disappeared. This is equivalent to the number of abortions in 2011. The whole of Bedford disappearing? That can give you an idea of the gravity of this. And from this, this large number, 49% were to women with partners. That is, people who are married, aborting their kids. And 51% were to women who had no partner. And this is just 2011. The second, the third thing we'd like to look at, brothers and sisters, with our society, and we as parents have to be aware of it, is that many of us, unfortunately as parents, we believe that our children are cast from gold. That our children are made from gold. And somehow, in their daily life, around them, is a bubble protecting them. They are protected by a bubble. And so whatever's happening in the society doesn't affect them. They are above this. <coughs> However, the reality, unfortunately, is often the opposite. And I say this all the time. Our schools and colleges and universities are like killing fields. And so when our children come home, we have to debrief them. We have to ask them, what happened at school today? What did you do today? What did you see today? What did you learn today? And if we don't just mean academically, not just did they get an A grade or a B grade or a C grade, but socially what happened? And this is something for all of us, including myself. But we have to learn and to develop the patience to deal with the questions and the problems of our children. Because unfortunately, our children, they live in this time with the spread and the proliferation of this fitna. 
The third of these things that we'd like to look at, brothers and sisters, is the proliferation of music. The Prophet وسلم, told us in a hadith that has been related by Abu Malik al Ash'ari, where he said he heard the Prophet وسلم, say that there will be min ummati, from my nation, yistahilun, a group of people who will make permissible. And he mentioned وسلم, from these things they make permissible. Al Ma'azif, music. So the Prophet has told us that this thing that is not permissible, they will make it permissible. From this thing, these things that are not permissible, that they are haram, that they will make halal, is what, brothers and sisters, is music. We learn from the Quran in Surah Al Luqman. Especially the young brothers, they should memorize this. Yes? In Surah Luqman, in the sixth verse, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And from mankind is he who purchases, who buys idle talk to mislead people from the path of Allah without knowledge and take it as a way of mockery. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this word, verse of the Quran, Lawul hadith. Idle talk, lawul hadith. How did the Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them all, understand this compound noun, lawul hadith, idle talk? How do they understand idle talk? Brothers and sisters, they understood idle talk to mean music, singing. Music and singing. So we have here somebody asking themselves, Brother Talib, what's bad with singing and music? What's wrong with it? It's a form of entertainment where we enjoy ourselves. There's a few things we need to understand that we need to learn about the music industry and about music itself. Music, brothers and sisters, especially in our culture, is a very important part of the culture. It is everywhere and in everything. It's in our mobile phones. It's in... The intercom systems, when you call uh, the hospital or somewhere, what do you get? You get music, isn't it? It's on television adverts, when they have an advert, what do they have? Music. On programs like the news, which is supposed to be factual and informative, we have music. It is everywhere, and it's a very important part of our culture. If something is important and it's part of the culture, it means that it has a very serious impact on you, how you live your life, isn't it? If it's something that's part of the culture, and everybody sees it, or everybody does it, it means it has a way of controlling us. And so, what we find with music, and I will give some examples in a minute, inshallah ta'ala, that music can make something good, <coughs> such as believing in Allah, seem bad, and something which is bad, such as becoming intoxicated to a level where you don't know if you're, you're left from your right or if you're conscious or unconscious seem very good. <coughs> and so the music industry, which is a $20 billion industry, a massive industry with people who are marketing this product at every level from the time the music gets to you, from the first note uttered from the instrument or from the singer, there are people marketing and distributing this music. But if we were to look at contemporary music, brothers and sisters, we see that music today gives us certain messages that are more, to, when it comes to our spiritual selves, mortal. If we were to look at music, and first of all, I'd like to say to the older generation, my age especially, that I'm about to say some lyrics, to read some lyrics, and it is not just to be profane or to be bad, but for parents who do not know what is happening out there. Many of us as parents that we are so busy with our lives, busy with our families, earning a living, that we have no idea what our children are into. I'm hoping that what I'm going to say for the next five minutes will be a wake-up call. 
if we were to look at what is out there in terms of music, brothers and sisters, it is really shocking. And some of the messages that we get from music, brothers and sisters, it is killing to one's soul. For example, music today we find that it calls to immorality and lifestyles that are totally against Islam. And so we have, for example, a singer by the name of Katy, P Katy Perry. Katy Perry, she is a woman. And she sung a, a song called, I Kissed a Girl and I Liked It. This is a, a lifestyle antithetical to Islam. There is a song that recently came out by a man by the name of Robin Thicke. And he sang in this song, No doesn't always mean no. So this man here is promoting rape. And we may laugh at it, find it funny, but imagine, brothers and sisters, that if this evil is not spoken out, who from our women folk is safe? That it has a reality upon you. That people, unfortunately, they listen to, to music, and sometimes it carries them away. Another thing that we find from music, that it calls to the worship of the devil. And so a rapper by the name of Jay-Z, he said, Lord forgive him, he got them dark forces in him, but he, all, he also has got a righteous cause for sinning. On the surface of it, to somebody, it just sounds like lyrics. But those people who worship the devil, they believe, their belief, that the devil was an angel. He is a fallen angel. That is, he was a an angel that was in heaven, but because of sin, he disobeyed God, he came down to this earth. Him being kicked out of heaven was unjust. That Allah kicked him out of heaven unjustly. And because of this injustice, he has a right to sin. And so we have Jay-Z, and we could spend another hour just talking about Jay-Z. But here we have an example of Jay-Z promoting the worship of the devil. Also, there is a singer by the name of Marilyn Mason. Marilyn, as in Marilyn Monroe, and Mason, sorry, Marilyn Manson. Manson, as in Charles Manson, the lunatic murderer. And he has a song where he says, but I'm not a slave to God that doesn't exist. He says, but I'm not a slave to God that doesn't exist. And he doesn't sell just one or two hundred records. These are people who are selling the millions of records around the world. And can you imagine how many thousands of young people are listening to those, these lyrics right now, as we are speaking? And how many people are listening to him? Marilyn Mason, Manson, sorry. And Marilyn Manson himself is a high priest of the Church of Satan. And in an in a interview he said, one of the purposes of his music is to take out the idea of God from people's minds. To take out the idea of God from people's minds. <coughs> Another thing we find in contemporary music, brothers and sisters, is that it promotes violence and just killing for the sake of killing. If we look at the rapper, Big Pun, he says, make way for Krill, I don't play, I spray for real. Blow your top with the Glock, that's my favorite kill. Blaze your crib with like 30 shots. And so the young guys over here are all laughing, because they've probably heard this before, yes? So you've exposed yourselves, brothers, yes? Yes? They have exposed themselves, and we seek refuge in Allah from this. But this is what, and we ask the young people, am I right? Lots of people listen to this type of music, yes or no? I'm not saying you do, young people. Do lots of people listen to this music? Yes or no? You tell me. Yes, yes. yes they do. Here we find a clear, clear example of the glorification of violence. Imagine somebody came in your house and killed your family. How would you feel? Would you be happy? Would you be smiling? Of course not. But here's a clear example of somebody who glorifies killing and murder and violence. Another example is a rapper by the name of Ludacris. And he is very ludicrous, yes? He said, I caught him with a blow to the chest. My hollow put a hole in his vest. 
I'm about to send two to his dome. So he talks about shooting somebody. He shot him in the chest, went through his vest, and I was about to shoot two bullets to his head. Now some people say this is only entertainment. This is only entertainment. But this type of music, brothers and sisters, it feeds into a particular, particular mentality. And possibly the question and answers, we can deal with this type of mentality. And we find our young people who are into this quote-unquote gangster lifestyle. You ask them what type of music you listen to. This is the music they listen to. This is the type of music that inflates their ego and makes them feel that they are gangsters. Another thing that we find, brothers and sisters, when it comes to contemporary music, music of today, that it calls to the rejection of Jannah, that the person doesn't want to go to Jannah. We find the rapper Biggie Smalls in a, a record called uh, Suicidal Thoughts. He said, when I die, I want to go to hell. Because I'm a piece of, then he swears, it ain't hard to tell. It don't make sense going to heaven with the goody goodies dressed in white. I like black tims and hoodie hoodies. A stuff for Allah when to be late. Yeah? Now, it seems funny to us. It seems funny to us. Because young people, they listen to this music with a beat behind it and they just focus on the lyrics, not what is said. The style of the lyrics and the music going together. But they never ask themselves, what is this man saying? What is this person saying? And this is what he's saying. He said, I don't want to go to hell. Why does he, sorry, he doesn't want to go to heaven. He doesn't want to go to Jannah. Why? Because he likes black Tims. Tims are Timberland shoes and hoodie hoodies. Yes? The gangster apparel. He likes dressing like a gangster. Where he knows going to Jannah, he won't be able to act. Or dressed like a gangster, so he doesn't want to go there. He wants to go to hell instead. And can you imagine, brothers and sisters, a young person listening to this, how it formulates their thoughts? A young person listening to this in their radio, on their radio, or listen to this on their Walkman, then all of a sudden, bam, in a car accident. And they die listening to this type of music. Is this Su al Khatima? Or husnul khatima, it's a good end or a bad end? Who says this is a good end to die listening to this music? Raise your hand. Who thinks this is a bad way to die, that is listening to this music then dying? Raise your hand. I think we're almost universal, yes? <coughs> Another example of rejecting Jannah can be found in a song by a rock group, Metallica. Metallica, they, saw, they sang, Devil take my soul, with diamonds you repay, I don't care for heaven, so don't you look for me to cry, and I will burn in hell from the day I die. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Who has the strength to say that? Who from amongst us has the strength to say, Devil take my soul, with diamonds you repay, I don't care for heaven, so don't look for me to cry, and I will burn in hell till the day I die. Who has strength to say this, except for a shaitan? And I'm not going to, if I was to ask any of, of us, who has the strength to openly say this, I don't think any of us has the strength to say this. But our young people are listening to these type of lyrics, and it is formulating their thought patterns. Another thing that we find with contemporary music is that it promotes success in this life is, through, is only through servitude to the devil. By serving the devil, I can be successful in this life. And I'll give some examples. Kanye West, who's a, a multi-billion dollar singer, he said, I sold my soul to the devil. I know it was a crappy deal. Least it came with a few toys like a happy meal. So he said, and remember, for those of you who know him, Kanye West, his first record was Jesus Walks. Yes? Where he talks about Jesus, Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam, saving people. Am I right, young brothers? Yes? 
How did you get from Jesus walks to I sold my soul to the devil? How? How do you make such a, a, a jump from the way to save yourself? If you see the video, he has somebody who was drunk, a woman in prostitution. And how do they save themselves? By going towards Jesus. Am I right, young brothers? Yes? How do you get from over there to all the way to I sold my soul to the devil? And so here we have Kanye West telling you, how did he become famous? How did he get money? By selling his soul to the devil. We also have Eminem, another rapper. He said, if I could go back, I never would have rapped. I sold my soul to the devil and I'll never get it back. So what? Because of rapping, becoming famous, and selling his soul to the devil, he got money, yes? This is the message they're sending out. Last of all, another very famous rapper by the name of Tupac Shakur. Tupac Shakur, what did he say? He said, I sold my soul, for a, I sold my soul to the devil for a chance to kick it and bang. I sold my soul for a chance to kick it and bang. Meaning he sold his soul so he could have a good time, a fun time. So we see, brothers and sisters, clearly, I'm not making it up. It's been recorded. Go to the website and check these lyrics for yourself. Here's a clear message to young people. And remember, this is only a sample. This is some of them. I could bring artist after artist and person after person. For example, and we don't talk ill of the dead, Peaches Geldof, who died recently, she joined the OTO. What is the OTO? The OTO is an organization which practices magic that was founded by a man by the name of Alistair Crowley or Crowley. Alistair Crowley, when he was alive, he was called the wickedest man on earth because Alistair Crowley was somebody who, who, who not only practiced magic, and all different types of magic. We have young ears here, so I can't, can't repeat the things that he said and did. But he practiced magic, and he promoted magic. And he set up his own organization. And Peaches Geldof, before she died, she has a tattoo. O, full stop, T, full stop, O. She joined the organization and encouraged people to join the organization. And so this issue of devil worship is a very serious issue. Another thing that we find, brothers and sisters, in contemporary music, that especially the parents that are here today should be aware of, that it promotes blasphemy. Blasphemy meaning to speak ill or bad about God or religion. And so we have, we, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for repeating these things, because I, I repeat these things so that parents and people are aware. Kanye West said, in the same video clip where he said he sold his soul to the devil, he said, I wonder if God asked Mike how to moonwalk. And we seek refuge in Allah. What does this mean? He said, he wonders if God asked Michael Jackson how to moonwalk. To teach him how to moonwalk. For somebody who said Jesus saves from a Christian background, how did he get to this stage? Open a clear blasphemy <coughs> that God, the creator, the sustainer of the universe and everything in it, asked Michael Jackson how to moonwalk. And I am sure Michael Jackson himself, had he been alive or aware of this statement of Kanye West, he would have denounced him. Because Michael Jackson, if we, his video thriller, at the beginning he said he doesn't promote the occult and magic. So Michael Jackson himself believed in God and had some religion. I'm sure Michael Jackson himself would have censured Kanye West for this. We also have an example of a known rapper by the name of Progeny, Progeny, who is a rapper. He said, how dare you in your life walk past me? without acknowledging this man is G-O-D. How dare you walk past me without acknowledging, he's saying, that he is God. Another group called the Poor Righteous Teachers, they're a rap group from the 90s, they said, 
Praises are due to Allah. That's me. So he sees himself as Allah. And we explained that they belong to a, a group called the 5% Nation, which is not an Islamic group anyhow. And that these people have the false belief that they, that is, men are God. And they're Allah. A rapper by the name of Rakim, Rakim is a respected rapper. If you were to do a chart, a, a, a chart of rappers, Rakim would probably come number two, number one, number three, like that. A well-respected rapper. He said in one of his, his, his songs, Holy are you? Rakim Allah is about to reveal the biggest secret in time, men are God. So he's saying in this record that men, humans are God. And this is what young people are listening to, repeating and believing. The last of these fitna, these trials and tribulations we like to look at, and I know we only have, I think, is it 15 minutes left? 15, 20 minutes left, we like to look at a very big and serious fitna, brothers and sisters. And all the parents should be aware of it. The fitna of murder and people being killed senselessly. Abu Musa, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, Inna bayni yadayya sa'a ayyaman yufa'u fihi al-ilm wa yanzilu fihi al-jahl wa yukthuru fiha al-haraj wa al-haraj al-qatl. Abu Musa, in this hadith which has been collected by Al-Imam Bukhari, he said, The Prophet ﷺ said, Near the establishment of the hour, there will be days, or a time, when religious knowledge will be taken away, will disappear, and ignorance will spread, and there will be Al-Haraj. And he said ﷺ, that Al-Haraj means killing, that killing will spread. And this killing, brothers and sisters, we don't just mean one or two people killing. The Prophet ﷺ prophesied, he told us that this killing will proliferate, be everywhere and spread, and often without any reason. Abu Huraira tells us that the Prophet ﷺ said, the world will not come to an end until a day would come to the people on which the murderer would not know as to why he is killed. And the person killed will not know as to why he had been murdered. And it would be said, and it was said, why would it happen? To which he replied, it would be because of general massacre and bloodshed. And the slaughterers and the slain will be in the fire. And the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in an authentic hadith that had been collected by Al-Imam Ahmed, where he said that that there will be al-haraj, haraj meaning killing. And they said, will there be more killing than the killing that exists now? Then the Sahaba were talking at the time of jihad and the spreading of Islam and then being persecuted. He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, it will not be you killing the disbelievers, it will be you killing each other, such that a man will kill his neighbor and kill his brother and kill his uncle and kill his cousin. They said, Subhanallah, glory be to Allah. Will we have our minds then? And he said, no, except the mind of the people that time will be taken away such that one of you would think that he is upon something, but he would not be upon anything. And so I mentioned these three hadith to emphasize from the Prophet wasallam a prediction, a prophecy that there will become a time in which there will be rampant killing and murder. And this killing will not be for reason. For example, somebody wants to rob or steal something from somebody. So he kills him in the process. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, there'll be absolutely no reason for it. Or the reason will be so insignificant, it's totally unjustifiable. As if murder could be justified. And let's look at some of the statistics, brothers and sisters. In the year 2012, last year, over 551 young people, the age of these young brothers here, young people were killed in London alone. 
Can you imagine that? 551 young people were killed. Sorry, 551 people were killed in the UK. In London, in London, sorry, in London, it was 157 young people being killed. So in the United Kingdom, 551 people were killed. In London alone, the capital, 157 young people were murdered. Of that, brothers and sisters, 105 were stabbed. They were killed with knives. 30 were shot, and the rest in different ways. And this, brothers and sisters, brings to our attention the danger of gangs, of our young people falling into gangs. And our young people falling into gangs, and I'm going to talk about Muslim offenders in a minute, which is shocking. It's just shocking that the person who has a heart and has Iman will leave here today shocked by the statistics I'm going to tell you. But gangs are so important, brothers and sisters, that of the shootings in the capital of our, of our country, of London, 22% of serious crime, including shootings, are done by people involved in gangs. And because of gangs and this violence that we have, brothers and sisters, in 2010 to 2011, over 2,000 young offenders, young people under the age of 18, 2,000 young offenders, that's a horrific number, but it gets even worse. In the year 2010 to 2011, Nearly 200,000 crimes were committed by young people, youth. 200,000 crimes were committed by young people. Again, for us to get a, a kind of understanding of the magnitude, it is like every single person in Bedford committing a crime. Can you imagine that? If every person in Bedford committed a crime, it would be a horrible place to live, wouldn't it? But we have over 2,000, 200,000 young people committing crimes. And young offenders, brothers and sisters, costs this country over four billion pounds annually. Four billion pounds, can you imagine what we could do with four billion pounds? How many jobs and services for young people we could create with four billion pounds? But brothers and sisters, if we were to look at Muslims, as offenders, it is a shocking statistic. The general population of prisons around the country, yes, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, 8% of the prison population were Muslim. It is now between 14 to 20%. 14 to 20% of people in prisons in the United Kingdom are Muslim. Say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And so we find the prison population, brothers and sisters, where it was once 5,000 to 6,000 in 2002, it is now nearly 12,000 people in 2013. 12,000 Muslims in the prison system here in our country. In London, nearly a quarter of those people in prison are Muslims. A quarter of those people who are in prison are Muslims. Half of the ten, the top ten prisons, the top ten prisons in the United Kingdom, the top ten prisons, yes, half of them have significant Muslim population. And so, for example, Belmarsh has, Walaikum Salaam, has 19 to 29%. Brixton Prison, 24%. Pentaval Prison, 28%. Thameside Prison, 25 And Wormwood Scrubs, 27% of that population are Muslim. 
And so we see, brothers and sisters, the great big danger to us as a community, if we don't pay attention to these fitna, these trials and these tribulations that our Prophet has prophesied over 1,400 years ago, and how this evil and other evils, it doesn't stay amongst the bad people, no. But it spreads throughout the society, overtaking the good and the bad. And I leave you with one hadith, and then we open the floor to questions, answers, clarifications. There's a hadith that has been narrated by Osama ibn Zayd, that illustrious companion, where once the Prophet وسلم, he stood over one of the high buildings of Medina, and then he said to the people, do you see what I see? And they said, no. And he said, I see fitna falling among your houses as raindrops fall. SubhanAllah. This is Medina in the time of the Prophet And he told them, I see fitna falling on your houses the way I see raindrops fall. And this hadith, brothers and sisters, should be more than enough, besides all the things that I have said before it, for us to realize and recognize the importance of us to, as we said, from the Quran, saving ourselves and our families from a hellfire whose fuel is men and stones. SubhanAllah. We open the floor ta'ala to any questions, any clarifications. Uh, if I'm able to answer them, alhamdulillah. If I'm not, we have the son Ahmed who is here, who is more than qualified to answer them. The brother. Only a clarification. Yes, sir. I'll start thank you. Wa alaikum sir. You're saying about the prison populations, and a lot of them, um, it's highly popular, uh, a lot of Muslims basically. There are a lot of Muslims in the prison population. Uh, wouldn't you agree, though, that a lot, there's a lot of um, racism going on where a lot of them are falsely accused because it's just because they're Muslims? You get that a lot in contemporary society. The brother asked the question, he said, concerning the prison population, wouldn't you say that it is racism? Amongst the reasons why there is disproportionate amount of the number of Muslims in prison, it is because of racism. The brother asked the question. I would say there are a number of reasons why. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. You find that there are a number of, a, a significant amount of Muslims in prison. For example, you're right, it could be because of racism, directly or indirectly. Another reason is because of urban deprivation. Muslims tend to live in urban areas, inner city areas, that are subject to high amounts of deprivation. As we all know, in areas of deprivation, one of the ways to survive is through what we call the black economy. Not the main economy, but the periphery economy, selling drugs and all other illegal activities. Unfortunately, many young people, they fall into this, they engage in crime, they get caught, and they then are given a custodial sentence. Our, 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 our job here today hasn't been to analyze and say why, but to bring to attention that if we don't do something, this is what could happen. Remember, this increase in Muslims in prisons is over the last decade. The last decade. If we are now 20%, Allah forbid what it will be like in 10 years time, or 20 years time. Or 30 years time, will you walk into a prison and from the gate all the way to the visiting area, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. Give us salams all the way through because everybody's Muslim. Now, I can't speak for anybody else. To me, that's shocking. That to me is shocking. That if we can go to prisons and it is Shocking for us as a community that we should want to do something, not just lament and think about it, want to do something. I hope that answers that question, inshallah. Any other questions? Yeah, bro. Um, my question regarding the, um, the music and uh, the um, selling your soul to the devil. If uh, a person is chosen to sell their soul to the devil, yeah. um, does that mean that if they've come to their senses, you know, where they say, oh, this is wrong, is it possible? Because a lot of people say that you can't come back to kind of Islam or kind of like a like something to save you from like the devil. Is it true? Or like Michael Jackson, there was rumours that he uh, he could reverted to Islam before he died. 
Um, I'm just, I was just curious if you were... Uh, the brother asked the question, if somebody sold his soul to the devil, can he repent? Uh, we learn from the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives any sin, any sin, except for the person dying upon shirk. If the person dies upon shirk, then they go to the hell fight eternally. But before they die, inshallah ta'ala, the, the door of repentance is open. So we ask Allah, if the person is com contemplating of selling their soul to the devil, they repent to Allah for such an evil belief or thought, and they do not meet Allah with that thought. Because meeting Allah with that thought is dangerous for their faith, for their iman. As for the person who became a devil worshipper, I say, Allahu Allah, maybe Sheikh Ahmed could give some light on it. Because in the Christian tradition, the person who sells their soul to the devil, the devil does not accept you relinquishing the deal. Am I right? Yes? If you say, I don't want to sell my soul to you anymore, that's it. Yes? However, alhamdulillah, as Muslims, that we ask Allah that if we make any mistake, from the big mistake to the small mistake, that he gives us the ability to make tawbah to him, to repent to him, and he accepts that tawbah. But I say from the get-go, before anybody thinks about it, to make tawbah to Allah, that we don't have those type of thoughts. As for, he also mentioned Michael Jackson. He said something very important. He said, Michael Jackson became Muslim before he died. I have one question to ask. Where's your proof? Oh, no, I said apparently. Uh, I Definitely. Know. I'm saying, where is the proof? Yes? I've heard many people say this. Even there's supposed to be an anashid on the internet which they claim is Michael Jackson, which isn't Michael Jackson, yes? But that needs to be substantiated. I am sure if Michael Jackson died as a Muslim, his brother Jermaine would have ensured, Jermaine Jackson is a Muslim, that he would have ensured that he had a janazah. He didn't have a janazah, did he? Not to my knowledge, yes? So I don't know if Michael Jackson died as a Muslim, only Allah knows best. Uh, can we ask if the brothers can give some paper to the sisters and to get some, if they have any questions, they can write them down and pass them to us? Young brother? Um, on TV, there are a number of shows um, about magic, and some, some shows um, show how they, how they do the magic, and some don't. Are they both wrong? Uh, the young brother asked the question, there are some shows that show, ma so show magic, are they haram? Am I right? Yes, your question. I would say to all of this magic, whether, it's, whether it is the sleight of hand or using the jinn, is something that the Prophet wasallam never did and never encouraged his sahaba to do and those who followed them, the people of righteousness to do, to stay away. We don't need to say, is it halal or haram? We know they didn't do it, it didn't give them good in this life. So we stay away from it. Am I right? Another important issue, many of the magicians today do not do, for example, card tricks. They have one minute nothing in their hand, the next minute it's two cards. Many of the magicians today, if you look at them, they use the jinn, like David Blaine, for example. It is clear and apparent. He's not doing a trick. It is something beyond a trick. Yes? Many of these magicians that are coming up now, they have shows and programs, they seem to be doing things with the jinn, and this is haram. It is prohibited to do magic using the jinn, or anything else, using talismans, using incantations, and anything to do with magic is haram. That type of, that type of, of actions are haram, and we should definitely stay away from it. So that, I hope that answers your question, inshallah. And I don't know if Sheikh Ahmed at his time would like to add to it, add to it what would like to think. Any other questions? No, just, just for my son, he asked about the magic. Because he asked me, it's haram, I told him it's haram. Because yeah. the one that watching him, he watched the program, he do something unbelievable, you know? Yeah. Something like jinn. Yeah. And I know, but I, I don't know how to explain that's yeah. jinn and that's shaitan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I'm a creation of the Lord.